Okay, good afternoon, everyone. The plan today is to go through any questions that you have from question one. Then we're going to do a couple of other quick examples, and we're going to try um, some other problems from the textbook. So all of the questions in number one are asking you to find an area where this is true. The, the conditions that have to be true for this to work, what we talked about yesterday, is that the function has to be above the x-axis over the entire interval, interval from A to B, and it has to be continuous from A to B. Okay. Um, the bottom line, and there's two ways to look at this, is we discovered yesterday, or we proved, we were told, however you want to look at it, that the area in that enclosure is equal to the antiderivative evaluated at B. minus the antiderivative evaluated at A. So the, the procedure, if you take that approach, is to anti-differentiate the function, then evaluate that antiderivative at B and evaluate it at A and subtract the two numbers. Um, there's a little bit more to it than that, and this will be useful for later. Rather than writing it that way, what we can say is the area is this thing, which is called the integral of the function evaluated from A to B. And, you know, even though the appearance of what I've just written looks considerably different than what's above, it means the same thing. So, in fact, when you are doing this with this notation I've written in brown, it really involves doing what's above. It's just that it allows you to do some algebraic maneuvering that you would not be able to do by just thinking of it as an antiderivative. So does anybody have any questions you would like me to go over from this section? Go ahead, Zebi. I? Okay. So we want to find the area between the function y equals e to the x and the x-axis from negative 2 to 4. Let me just, um, before we do anything here, sketch y equals e to the negative x y equals e to the negative x is a decreasing exponential function with an asymptote on the x-axis. This is kind of a math 30 idea when we learn about exponential functions. Let me just thin that out a bit. That's better. So that's what y equals e to the negative x looks like. So in terms of, and I, I'm not going to try to squeeze this in as a diagram with detail because when I get over to 4, that function is going to be really, really close to the x-axis. But over here at x equals negative 2, the function is above the x-axis. Over here at x equals 4, the function is above the x-axis. So what we're trying to do is find that sliver of area. And we can see it on the graphing calculator in a bit. The area here in this question for i will be the integral from negative 2 to 4 of e to the negative x dx. And I've decided today anyway that I'm going to kind of force you to adopt that notation and that procedure. I know that there are still going to be some people that will look at this and they will say that area is equal to capital F of 4 minus capital F of negative 2. And that's not wrong. But if we can get used to that other notation earlier, it's better. Okay. Now, what does all of this mean? And I talked about this yesterday, but it takes a while to sink in sometimes. This... means anti-differentiate what's in between those two symbols. And we'll never really learn where it comes from. I can tell you bits and pieces. Uh, it, the S stands for sum. Th that elongated S means a sum of a whole bunch of tiny, infinitely small areas. And the reason why we're multiplying by dx is a derivative is over dx. A derivative is dy over dx. So the antiderivative is opposite. Anyway. It tells us to anti-differentiate e to the negative x, and the antiderivative of e to the negative x is negative 1 e to the negative x. Because 
when we differentiate e to the negative x, we get e to the negative x times negative 1. But we don't want that negative 1. So if I differentiate this function that I've written down, when I multiply by that negative 1, which is the derivative of the exponent, that negative 1 I put in front goes away, which is what I want. Does that make sense? OK. And I want to evaluate this from negative 2 to 4. I didn't really point this out to you yesterday, but I'm going to say it now. You always must have the larger number on the top. It has to be that way. I would personally here, Zebby, I would do this. There's not really much of a difference between those two things. What I'm saying is I'm not going to, if I did it this way, then I would have negative e to the negative 4 minus negative e to the negative of negative 2. That's what I would do there. Here, I'm just saying it's negative 1 multiplied by e to the negative 4 minus e to the negative negative 2. It just makes it a little simpler. So what I end up with is 1 over e to the 4 minus e squared. I don't know how far we want to take this in terms of simplifying. But I would now multiply that negative through and get e squared minus 1 over e to the 4. Suppose we could put these together with a common denominator, but I don't know that it's strictly speaking necessary. Are you okay with that? Okay. Other questions? Go ahead, for, uh, Arden. L. L? Okay, so we want to find the area from 0 to 1 of 2. Oh, you know what, I should, I'm going to go back here and I, I did say I would look at it on the graphing calculator. So, and I'll get to L in a second. But if I look at this on the graphing calculator, I'm going to enter the function which is e to the negative x. I don't know that I need that brackets around the negative x. I don't think I do, but just to be safe. Um, I'm going to go zoom standard first. I just want to take a look at what it looks like. Uh, so negative 2 to 4, I'll go negative 2.5 to 4.5, and I think negative 0.5 to, I'll go 6. I just want to see it a little better. You can see what I mean by it getting very, very thin as we get closer to 4. If I calculate the integral from negative 2 to 4, it's going to shade it in. And it's still shading, still shading, still shading. And it tells me it's 7.37. Let's just check something out here. What do we have? E squared minus 1 over e to the 4. And, and I mean, I, I know you know this, but I'll repeat it anyway. You don't have to do this every time. I'm just pointing out to you that it's working. Okay, L. Is that right, Arden? Okay. So um, 2e to the negative 2x is going to be a very similar looking graph. And given that I've already told you all of these functions in question 1 are positive and continuous over the interval. You don't need to do this, but as we're going to see later today, you have to do it sometimes because sometimes it's not entirely above the x-axis. And we're going to have to learn something new today. Anyway, we want to go from negative from 0 to 1. So this is 0. 1 is here. This is the area we're trying to find, which is entirely above the x-axis. This will be the antiderivative from 0 to 1 of 2e to the negative 2x. 
dx. You do need to write that dx. Rather than me saying I'm going to anti-differentiate 2e to the negative 2x, I'm going to factor that 2 out of the integral. And I can always do that with constants. So this becomes 2 multiplied by the integral from 0 to 1 of e to the negative 2x dx. And now I can focus my attention on anti-differentiating this, right? And the antiderivative of that, I think you're probably, everybody getting better and better at this, the antiderivative of that will be negative one-half e to the negative 2x. Because the antiderivative of e to the is in general e to the, but without that negative one-half, when we differentiate this thing, I'll end up with a negative 2 in front, which I don't want. I'm going to go one step further again. Rather than having that negative 1 half as part of the thing I want to apply the 0 to 1 operation to, I'm going to move that negative 1 half out. and simply do that. So those, those constants, those factors that are numerical can always be just, you keep piling them outside and carrying them forward. That means I have negative one multiplied by, this will be e to the negative two times one minus e to the negative two times zero. So again, I go upper minus lower or bigger minus smaller in terms of a and b. And I end up with negative, well, I'll do it in steps. Negative 1 times e to the negative 2 minus 1. I'm going to multiply that negative 1 through and get 1 minus e to the negative 2, or 1 minus 1 over e squared. And I've been so sloppy with this yesterday and today. I, I said to myself last night, you've got to fix this. We need to be writing u squared or unit squared for all of our areas, okay? So whatever this number is, this is a number of square units. And, and what a square unit is, is if we graph this thing, and this is one and this is one, then this is one square unit. That's what it means. It's just a one by one square. It's a pixel almost. Does that help? Okay. Other questions? Go ahead, Arden. P? Okay. We're we're going to have to you're gonna to have to take my word for it that this function is entirely positive everywhere from one to two, okay? Um, I'm not sure what this is gonna look like. We can take a peek later, but trust me. The only place this function will ever be negative is if x is negative. If x is positive, then this piece is positive, and this is raised to a 4, so it's going to be positive. I don't know what it's going to look like in between. It's an odd function. It's going to, I'm guessing it's just going to look like this through the origin, just that kind of a thing. But we want to evaluate this integral. This is what we actually call a definite integral because we're going to find a definite value to it. The question now is, how do you anti-differentiate that? And what we have, this is the substitution thing that you will learn later, there's a method for it, is we have two factors of this integrand, that thing we want to anti-differentiate should be thought of as an integrand, and one of the factors is this x, and the other factor is this x squared plus one, raised to the 4. And where the method of substitution would be identified as being useful is as soon as you say to yourself that the more complicated thing, 
what I've highlighted in yellow, has an argument, x squared plus 1, whose derivative contains the other piece. Right? So what we're saying is we could identify, I so want to do substitution here, but I better not. We're identifying this as the argument of the more complicated piece, and the derivative with respect to x of that thing will give us 2x, which contains the less complicated piece. Okay. So how are we going to anti-differentiate this then? We're essentially going to say, I want to check something. I hope I didn't write. No, I just want to make sure I didn't make an error back here in my notation. What we're going to do is we're going to ignore the x that I've highlighted in blue, Arden, and just say, what is the antiderivative of a thing to the 4? And the answer is, it would be that thing to the 5. When we learn the method of substitution, you will, have, you will not have to reason out what the antiderivative is. You will not be saying things like, in general, the antiderivative of a thing to the, five, uh, to the 4 is a thing to the 5. Okay? But if you were to differentiate this, we would have to swing the 5 down, and we do not have a 5 up here. So I could go even further and say the antiderivative of a thing to the 4 is one fifth multiplied by that thing to the five. Is that, are you still with me? But now, what we're going to do is we're just going to, this is scrap paper or us thinking, what is the derivative with respect to x of that thing of x squared plus one raised to the five? Well, of one fifth times x squared plus one to the five. It is bring the 5 down, 1, x squared plus 1 to the 4, and that's really good because we want th that, right? Times the derivative of what's inside, which is 2x. And that's good because we want the x, but we don't want the 2. Which means we need another factor of a half here. It's, it's, a, it's puzzle solving until you learn the method of substitution. L before we go on, let me just clean this up a bit and write it as 1 tenth, and then I have x squared plus 1 raised to the 5. We're going to evaluate this from, I can't remember, 1 to 2. Can you confirm that if you differentiate if you differentiate this thing, that it will give you the blue and the yellow above. Wait, where did your x go? Okay, so where did it go? in this method that we're doing where the derivative of the argument of the more complicated thing contains the less complicated thing. In this method, we ignore the less complicated thing because it's going to take care of itself with the chain rule. If I differentiate, so you're, you might be tempted to put an x there, but we don't need to and we, we can't. If I differentiate this thing in green, I would have to wrap that 5 around the base, which stays the same. 5 times 1 over 10 is 1 half. I would drop 1 from the exponent. And then I would multiply by the derivative of what's inside, and these two twos cancel, so the x is there. Yeah, I kind of You're good now? Okay. And, and by the way, since the derivative of the green thing is what we wanted to anti-differentiate, then the green thing is the antiderivative. Um, rather than doing this, and I'm just going to write this down 
because I think in this case it really highlights the absurdity of keeping that one-tenth there. You would have to have one-tenth times 2 squared plus 1 raised to the 5 minus 1 tenth times 2 times 1 squared plus 1 to the 5. You can see that you could factor the tenth out here, right? So don't factor it out to begin with. Don't have it in both of the terms. So this is 1 tenth multiplied by the x squared plus 1 to the 5, and the x squared plus 1 to the 5 is from 1 to 2. I don't, I, you don't need to do this. It's enough that you know you're just going to do that part and then multiply the whole thing by 1 tenth. So it's 1 tenth, and then I'm going to have 2 squared plus 1 to the 5, plus 1 squared plus 1 to the 5. 2 squared is 4. Oh, yuck. Plus 1 is 5. 5 to the 5 is 60. Yeah, I'm guessing. 3125 plus 2 to the 5 is 32. Apparently, it's 3157 over... Is 2 to the 5 32? Yeah, it's 3157 over 10. That seems awfully big. But this is a, is a degree 10 function. Yep. Thank you. There's a common mistake, by the way. Yes, we're supposed to subtract. Um, so it is 3093 over 10. Okay. I think it's just always interesting. Well, it's 309.3. I think it's always interesting to look at these functions. It was x times x squared plus 1 to the 4. I mean... This makes it a degree 9 polynomial function. Because you have x squared to the 4, which if you FOIL it out will be x to the 8, times the x is x to the 9. So this is a very steep function at even moderate values of x. But let's see if I can get some good window settings here. Yeah, I mean, look how, look how quickly it's, it's growing away from the x-axis. I can't even see the air in here. There is some air in there. But if I were to go zoom standard, you could see the air, but you would lose the rest of the graph. What did we say, 309.3? Three hundred nine point three. You can't even see the area. I suppose we could do this. Uh, probably knock off a ten. Yeah, you'd be able to see some of it now. Anyway, is that okay? Okay. Other questions? Go ahead. H.
So what H translates to is we want to find the integral of secant squared to secant squared of x dx from negative pi over 4 to pi over 3, which means we need to anti-differentiate secant squared. Isn't the derivative of tangent secant squared, or am I? No, it is. So, you know, and here's the thing, too, with all those formulas for derivatives of trig functions, when you're thinking backwards, it's very easy to second guess yourself. But I believe on your formula sheet it says the derivative of tangent is secant squared. There's no algebraic way to do that, you just have to know it. So, this becomes the tangent. I hope I didn't say tangent squared. If I did, I apologize. The tangent of x from negative pi over 4 to pi over 3. So really, we have to find the tangent of pi over 3 minus the tangent of negative pi over 4. Again, in all of this, we don't worry about the plus c, because there's a plus c in both of these. Uh, at pi over 3, which is here, the coordinates are 1 half comma root 3 over 2. I'm not going to bore you with the gory details here, but tangent would be root 3. It would be y over x. And when you divide root 3 over 2 by 1 over 2, you'll get root 3. Uh, at negative pi over 4, which is here, my circle is not drawn very well. This is 1 over root 2 comma negative 1 over root 2. So tangent is y over x. Since those two values have the same value, it's just that one's positive, one's negative, when we subtract tan of negative pi over 4, it will be subtracting negative 1. So the answer is root 3 plus 1, square units. I don't know. If that's a good idea, whatever the a and b are doesn't matter, because I don't know how you would anti-differentiate one over cos squared. So what I'm asking is, what it's asking is, what would you differentiate to get one over cos squared? And I think the only way that works in my, in my head anyway is to recognize that that's secant squared and the derivative of tangent is secant squared. I don't think this move gets you anywhere. You, you have to think, put it this way. When we say this, For every differentiation rule I've given you, and I'm not using u in the chain rule here because it's not that simple, I'm also giving you an integration rule. And if I, say, if I say the derivative with respect to x of sine x is cos x, then I'm telling you that the integral of cos x dx, dx is like saying relative to x, is sine x. And by the way, the derivative with respect to x of cos x is negative sine x, which means the integral of negative sine x is cos x. Are you still with me? Because I, I want to make a, an important point here. I can take that negative 1 out of the integral because it's just a factor. And I can write the negative of the integral of sine x dx is cos x. 
And I can move that negative to the other side. And now I've proven to you that the antiderivative of sine x is negative cos x, which we haven't proved before. We've just said, well, it's negative cos because the derivative of cos gives you negative sine, but we want positive sine. But you're not going to the unit circle until you've accomplished the task of anti-differentiating that. Cos of negative Okay, let's pursue that. I, th I think what you're saying is this. It's not negative 2x, it's cos to the negative 2 of x. Is that what you're saying? Okay, let's play this out. This is an important idea. It's not going to work. I'll tell you that right now. What I think you're thinking is you're going to use the power rule. Yes? Okay. So that would mean if this logic is sound, that this will be equal to, let's see, I raise the exponent by 1, right? and I divide by the new exponent, so in your mind, that's the antiderivative, right? That's what you're thinking? Well, you have to change it to Yeah. You, you're just gonna spiral around here in this whirlpool trying to stay above the water. It's not gonna go anywhere. Because the point, and some of you have seen this, some of you might not have, is if that's right, the derivative of that will give you what we started off with, which is 1 over cos squared, right? But the derivative of this I'm going to leave the c out will be cos of x to the negative 2 times the derivative of cos of x, which is negative sine of x. And if you think you can go, oh yeah, but I don't want the negative sine x, so I'm going to put this over negative sine x. That's going to make things even worse, because when you go to differentiate that, you're going to have to use the quotient rule. You can't eliminate variables by just dividing by the variable and expecting it to all work out. So, For trigonometry so far, you essentially read a derivative rule backwards. You have to. Okay. Um, okay, let's move on. I have a couple more examples I want to do today, and then we're going to get more practice with this stuff. So this, I don't know which page it's on, but it's the very next page of your handout. It says examples continued. Determine the area between 25 minus x squared and the x-axis. So this is different than anything else we've looked at because we've always been told from this value of x to this value of x. Now, when you see a question that says, determine the area between a function and the x-axis, it's implied that it is a contained area. It's an area that's enclosed by the x-axis and the function. Because, uh, let's face it, in some of these examples we looked at, we can look at this one where the function looked something like that and we were finding this area. That area is not contained by the function and the x-axis. It's contained by the function, the x-axis, and those two lines. So how can we talk about a contained function? Well, you should know what this function looks like. y equals x squared is a parabola with its vertex at the origin. y equals negative x squared is a parabola with its vertex at the origin opening downward. So y equals 25 added to that or 25 minus x squared will be a parabola whose vertex is up at 25 that opens downward. 
And I mean, you could graph it with a table of values or your calculator. Bottom line is this question is asking us to find this value, that area. So the first thing we need to do is find the x-intercepts. While the x-intercepts of the function are found by setting y equal to zero, it's a pretty trivial equation to solve, I think. x equals plus or minus five. And I mentioned to you yesterday, I didn't mention it again today, but I will do so now, that when we talk about this, it doesn't matter, I guess I can leave that, it doesn't matter where the y-axis is. I, I'm not going to prove it to you. The proof isn't that tough, but it's just not important. It doesn't matter whether the y-axis is here, or here, or here, or wherever, it doesn't matter. All that matters is the function is above the x-axis and it's positive everywhere. Or, and it's continuous, okay? So the fact that the y-axis here, I'm going to draw a better graph of this. You don't have to draw it. It's just nice if you can look at something that's a little better. The fact that The fact that this parabola has a vertex where part of it is on one side and part of it is on the other side of the y-axis doesn't matter. It goes from negative 5 to 5. After all that work, and I still didn't draw a decent parabola. It's symmetrical, right? Okay. So this area... must be equal to the integral from negative 5 to 5 of 25 minus x squared dx. I really like the integral notation rather than the capital F of x because it shows you what you have to anti-differentiate. Okay, well, we can do that. I'm going to start my work down here. This is the integral from negative 5 to 5 of x of 25 minus x squared dx. Okay. I, I, you know that I'm, I, I really want you to work top down, row by row. I think it's okay here to do the antiderivative and write it on the right-hand side and then work down. The antiderivative of 25 minus x squared is equal to 25x minus one-third x cubed. Uh, you know, plus a constant, I get it. But when we do the area problems, we don't need to include the constant. Can everybody confirm that that is the correct integral or antiderivative? Okay. So we are going to have to evaluate this at 5, which would be 25 times 5 minus 1 third times 5 cubed and subtract 25 times negative 5 minus 1 third times negative 5 cubed. Of course, remembering that we had better do that, right? And my advice, and you'll get some practice with this and you'll find your own bearing, is you don't try to enter this into your calculator at once. You figure out what this is and then you go minus and you figure out what this is. So I'm going to do that here. You can do it on your calculator. I think the first one is 250 over 3. 
¿No? Two hundred fifty over three. Okay. I just saw a couple people immediately shake their heads, and I was wondering if I've lost mine, which sometimes I do. But this is two fifty over three. Minus. I can do this one without even blinking. I know that this one's negative two fifty over three. It's an odd function. It, well, the function isn't odd. I better be careful here. The function may be odd, but what's important here is the antiderivative or integral is odd. Negative two fifty over three which gives me 500 over 3 square units. Can we have completed that problem and been a little smarter about it? And the answer is, of course, because knowing that this is symmetrical, and I'll see if I can do a better job of it this time, knowing that this thing is symmetrical, well, I'll cheat. I would know then that this brown area and this green area are the same. They have to be the same because that's the nature of symmetry, which would mean that if I want the total area, what I can do is find the integral from 0 to 5 of 25 minus x squared and double it. And there's that zero. Evan, I think you asked near the end of yesterday's class, oh, if it's zero, do we need to worry about it kind of thing? And for polynomial functions, you don't. What's going to happen here is you're going to get 2 times the antiderivative of this is 25x minus 1 third x cubed from 0 to 5. When you put zero in here, it's nothing. So you're going to have that thing at 5, which is 250 thirds, minus nothing, which is 250 thirds, times 2 gives you the 500 thirds. Any questions with that example? Liam? It's an intuitive thing. Yeah. Um, If, well, I, I'm going to leave further discussion for later. I want to get to this next example. But looking at the graph really helps. If you want to find an area and you discover that rather than finding this area plus this area, we can just find this area and triple it, then that will work, okay? Or double or whatever the case is. Okay, we have one more that I want to do here. Find the area between x squared minus 1 and the x-axis from negative 4 to 2. So... This is going to be a lot of work. We want to go from negative 4 to 2. It's not an enclosed area. Let's take a look at what this graph looks like. I know that x squared minus 1 is a parabola that started off as being x squared and it was shifted down 1. So it's a parabola whose vertex is at negative 1 and it opens up close enough, and it opens up and it has an x-intercept of negative 1, an x-intercept of positive 1, and a y-intercept of negative 1. And I want to find the area between, listen to the words carefully, between that and the x-axis from negative 4 to 2. Well, negative 4 is way over here. Negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4. I want to find all of this area underneath that because that's between the function and the x-axis. I also want to find the area here because that will also be between the function and the x-axis. Is this the example you have in your notes? It is. Good. And I also want to find this. 
which is an area between the function and the x-axis. Now, this area which I'm going to call number 1 and this area which I'm going to call number 3 all fit the conditions necessary for us to do what we've learned. They're continuous and above the x-axis. So area 1, that area will be the integral from negative 4 to negative 1 of x squared minus 1 dx. Area 3, which is part of what we want to find, will be the integral from 1 to 2 of x squared minus 1 dx. The question is, what is it we do with area 2, which is in the middle? And I could have done a better job with that graph, and I will in a second. In fact, I'm, I think I'm going to erase it right now. I think most of you saw that's what I was getting at, but the area kind of just looked like it was airbrushed into oblivion there because I, I couldn't go up to the function before. So what do we do about this third area? This is 1, this is 2, and this is 3. Sorry, this is 3 and this is 2. What do we do about that? Okay. So I want to explain something to you in general. If I have a function from A to B that is entirely below the x-axis, and I want to find this area, how is it I do that? I only know how to find an area if the function is above the x-axis. Now, this is f of x. Well, I can make this above the x-axis by multiplying the function by negative 1. And if I do that, I'm just doing this so that it will work. If I multiply that function by negative 1, and that will result in a vertical reflection across the x-axis, it will look like this. And this area is equal to the area I want to find. And I know that this area is the integral from a to b of the function. But that function, I don't know what that is, oh. But that function is not f of x. It's negative f of x. But I can take that negative and put it out in front. And this simply means when you're finding an area and the function is below the x-axis, you're finding the negative of the integral, which will give it a positive area. Evan, it looks like you want to ask something. You can, absolutely. The, the difficulty with that and the absolute value of the function will look like this. So your second area, and there's no need to write this down because I'm going to erase it, will be the integral from negative 1 to 1 of the absolute value of x squared minus 1. But the only way you can anti-differentiate the absolute value of x squared minus 1 is to write it in piecewise fashion and analyze where it's positive and where it's negative. And this just makes it easier. You've stumbled on something, and I will show you how we can get the answer very quickly on the calculator in a few minutes. Okay, But what we want to do here is have negative times the integral from negative 1 to 1 of x squared minus 1 dx. 
this is a beast of a question, right? Because you do all this work and now what you need to do is the following. And I'm not going to. I will get an answer for you. And you can try it on your own. You have to do this, everyone. You have to take one third x cubed minus x and evaluate it from negative four to negative one and add that to one third x cubed minus x. This is the antiderivative of x squared minus one. Evaluated from, that was the third part, which is one to two, and subtract the integral from negative one to one of x squared minus one. Sorry, x cubed, not an integral. We've already done that. Subtract the antiderivative from negative one to one. I mean, you have to do all that. And that means, maybe we can have time to get an answer here, I don't know. I need to put negative one in here and crunch these numbers and put negative four in here and crunch these numbers and subtract them to get this. And then I have to do the same thing here and I have to do the same thing over there. Are you with me on what would have to happen? Okay. Well, luckily we do have some technology which we can use to make our lives a little bit easier. I'm going to put in the function which was x squared minus 1. I'm going to go zoom standard just because. And what I'm going to do now is find the area between negative 4 and negative 1. Eighteen. When you crunch these numbers in here and you put negative one in and then subtract what you get when you put negative four in, this is 18. The piece on the right from one to two is four-thirds. Trust me, it's four-thirds. Okay. Minus, I'm going to do the same thing now from negative one to one. And some of you, I think you're, you know what's about to happen here. I'm going to calculate with my calculator the integral from negative one to one. Oops. And before I hit enter, I'm going to remind you of this little bit of business here. That without that negative, I get the right area, but it's got a negative in front of it. So when I do this and hit enter on my calculator, and my calculator shades it in and tells me it's negative four-thirds, that means if I were to reflect it up, it would become positive four-thirds. This here, when you crunch the numbers, will be negative four-thirds. So the area is 18 plus four-thirds for the third part plus four-thirds for the middle part which is 8 thirds, 3 times 8 is 54, 54 and 8 is 62 thirds. Yes, you need a seconder. 62 thirds. Square units. Now, just before I let you loose on some problems, I'm going to clear draw here to get rid of all of that stuff. What do you suppose 
my calculator will calculate. If I do the integral from negative four to two. It'll give me 18. Because it's 18 in that region, it's negative four thirds and then it's four thirds. This is like in physics 30 when you have an area under the force time graph, it's a negative impulse. Sometimes we wanna keep the negative, not in area questions, but negative four to, what did I say two? Yeah, two. It's gonna shade it all in, but it counts anything below as negative. Now to your point, well, if I just wanna cheat and get the answer, why don't I graph the absolute value of the function? All right, this is gonna fold everything up top without changing the size of the bump or the hill or the area. So when I calculate this, Not, not exact, right? it should be 0.6 repeating, but you know, these calculators aren't perfect. Um, whatever you do, I know everybody that this area is the integral from A to B of the negative of the function dx, and you should know that, right? you are not allowed to do this even though it gives you the right answer. You're not allowed to say, oh, well, I'm just gonna say that's the integral from B to A. That will also reverse things, but it's not allowed. The top number has to be bigger than the bottom number. 